Yeah, thank you. Um, so, um, as mentioned, I'm CEO of Augur AI, and we're an automated machine learning tool. Um, but I'm not here to talk to you about like, why Augur is a really good uh, automated machine learning tool. What I would like to do is talk to you about how AutoML can allow you as developers to easily build Uh, to easily build predictive models into your application. So I'm actually really excited about speaking at a conference where there's a mixture of the API world and the AI dev world. Because ironically enough, that's what I want to talk to you about. And outside of the scope of just using my particular auto ML tool, uh, we actually think there's an opportunity to build a standardized machine learning pipeline that can let people use auto ML and use standard pipelines and APIs for AutoML to build predictive models into all of their apps. So with that as an introduction, how many of you consider yourselves primarily developers? About half. How many of you consider yourselves data scientists? How many of you consider yourselves both? Okay, interesting. So slightly smaller. Um, so hopefully this will really appeal to you. Um, my belief is that because of the uh, recent efficacy that um, AutoML has started to achieve, and because of the ability to finally start driving um, AutoML products through the APIs, that you can be non-data scientist developers and just know you want predictive models and start pointing AutoML at your data, building predictive models and executing predictions. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about a proposal that we have for a standardized automated machine learning API. Um, uh, I'm going to talk to you about an open source project that we've built. Um, I'm actually the initial developer of it. It's called A2ML. Um, but in general, I want people to just see the, the possibilities here of take, using AutoML to not be a data scientist expert and build predictive models into their applications. So uh, our belief is that there are sort of generations of machine learning and automated machine learning. It started with a bunch of people building machine learning algorithms, TensorFlow, um, uh, Theano, PyTorch, um, H2O actually started as primarily just implementing algorithms, not so much about AutoML. And then there was this first generation AutoML uh, that included DataRobot, Teapot, AutoSK Learn, H2O then started Focusing more on that, uh, and of course, uh, you know, we, at Augur, we are one of those AutoML tools. Um, we believe there is a second, and, and those tools, if you go look at their marketing, they're more about, and this is a good thing um, that it started this way, they're more about appealing to the uh, data scientist, either the data scientist or the business analyst, what sometimes gets called a citizen data scientist. I've got a spreadsheet. I've got a bunch of features, I've got this thing I want to predict, I upload it, it tries hundreds of algorithms, it's got a leaderboard, you pick one and it gets you get sufficient accuracy after you train long enough and it picks the winning algorithm, random forests or cat boost or light GBM and then you, uh, you download that model or you use a hosted prediction service. I mean, don't get me wrong, these are very, very useful things, but they are not, the first generation was absolutely not developer oriented. We'll talk about the whole life cycle, and it's, it was not about automating the whole life cycle. It's about I got a spreadsheet, and now it's how I got it. Give me some code. Maybe somebody sent this to me. I built a predictive model, and it was just focusing on that little piece of getting a spreadsheet, getting the best algorithm. We believe there's a second generation of auto ML, and that includes a, a, that is very developer centric. It's all about automating this stuff, and then that um, creates, and we believe that's that second generation of AutoML that's very developer and API focused gives you as developers some really exciting opportunities to take your data, whether it's spreadsheets or SQL tables or whatever, and start building predictive models into your applications without necessarily being a data scientist expert. So we're very focused on this at Augur, and I'll talk in more detail about uh, the products that, that Google and Azure have built. Their automobile is absolutely developer-focused. It's not necessarily getting a ton of marketing from 
you know, they're respected organizations. A lot of people probably hard pressed to say, you know, what are the capabilities of Azure or AutoML? Um, but it is absolutely developer focused. Very robust APIs, very verbose APIs. Um, and I think there's some opportunity for simplifying it, but absolutely focused on the, like, I want to automate this whole process and embed it inside an application. Um, there's also, um, if you read any of the press on Uber Michelangelo, it was mostly like last year that it came out, late last year. It was very strange because there's no product that you can use. It was just Uber talking about the stuff they do internally. Um, and by the way, those phases that they talked about are absolutely the phases that we're going to talk about here, like the same names. And that's probably a little bit of fast follows and stuff we've like, blogged about. I don't care. Like, this is an exciting market, and we need lots of people talking about this. Then it turns out that the guys from Uber left uh, Michelangelo, and they started this company called Tecton that's very much in stealth mode, but I know a lot of stuff I'm probably not supposed to know about what they're doing. Um, Maybe there's people here from Tecton, but they're definitely chewing on the same problem um, of let's create something for developers that can automate all these different phases. Um, and then for those of you maybe beyond the scope of this talk, one of the things that we believe at Augur, and who knows we may be right or not, I believe we're right about second gen auto mount because that's already happened. Nobody's putting labels on it. You know, it's my own label that there's like the citizen data scientist first gen and developer in second gen. I'm saying, when all this gets done, we're going to even simplify it further, and there's just going to be two API calls. There'll be like train, and that happens one time, and then there's like predict, 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 and then when it fails to meet criteria, then you retrain, and it's even simpler. Sometimes I'll call this like Twilio for prediction. That hasn't happened yet, and we haven't even built this at Augur yet. I don't think the market's quite ready for that level of, you know, simplification. Um, but this, what this life cycle I'm going to talk to you about today, the second generation, um, is again whether or not you use our stuff. This, sorry, this life cycle is there, and it, it is it is the next logical step towards something even even simpler. So, what are these fundamental phases? Now, by the way, I'm not. This is not like me talking to you about like here's the Augur API and here's you know how we can make it simpler. This I'm saying. These phases, whether or not you use these exact names are, or not, are in all developer-oriented, cloud-oriented auto ML. So these phases are absolutely in uh, the Google APIs and absolutely in the Azure auto ML APIs. So there's an import phase. Get your data into a hosted machine learning optimized store. Now, it so happens that with Google, there's some idiosyncrasies. You can only get it from uh, Big Table and Google Cloud Storage. In other words, you can't go right from a CSV. So um, we'll talk a little bit about a project that we have, this HTML project that wraps these other APIs. And so what I do there is I actually use some third-party utilities, uh, actually the, uh, the, the Google Cloud demand line utilities to get it into Google Cloud Storage and then bring it into the machine learning optimized store. But that, that phase is real. Like uh, All of these hosted machine learning services expect to work on the data in some kind of machine learning optimized store that has like attributes of like, is this column a feature, or is it a target, whatever. Um, uh, Microsoft has the same thing in their API. It, they happen to have, you have to write a script for every data set that you work with called getdata.py. So it's a little weird, but there is that step there. Um, so there's an import phase. Then there's the train phase. And the train phase is, okay, you go and try lots of algorithms and hyperparameters, and every single one of these APIs has that train phase where you um, either have to find a search space, and it goes and tries lots of algorithms and hyperparameters that by default, or you've said like, hey, only try certain algorithms, maybe only explainable algorithms, or only algorithms that, that have certain runtime performance. Um, and then after the train phase, you'll have an evaluate phase. Um, and that is uh, where you'll look at the models and choose one. Now, in the citizen data scientist business analyst world, that is uh, typically a leaderboard, right? If any of you have used any AutoML tools, there's almost always a leaderboard. You look at it, you can usually pick the best one. Is there any reason why you wouldn't just pick the most accurate one? For those of you that 
farming data scientists. Why don't you pick the second best one or the third best one? Sorry? Yes, it's my build. So that's a, that's a big one. The other one is runtime performance. You might be like embedded in some device and you say, you know, I don't want to use random forest, it's just too big. Um, so, you know, what is the overhead at runtime? Uh, so you view the models and choose one. Now, here's the other thing where APIs are really critical, right? Because you don't always want to have that analyst like looking at it and saying, no, I picked the third best one because it's explainable. You probably want enough APIs so that your software can make an intelligent decision about what the best one is. It might, have, it might be a weighted thing. Maybe it, it only picks the more interpretable one as long as the trade-off in accuracy is not too high. Again, you need APIs to do that. In the first-gen AutoML, right, citizen data scientists, they're gonna make some judgment. But if you really wanna automate this stuff, you need enough APIs so that you can have some kind of scoring function, for example. Okay, the fourth step that all of them do is deploy the chosen, the chosen model to the cloud or embed. Uh, it happens that Google's AutoML, you can't uh, download it locally, but most of, the, most of the options give you, Microsoft will let you download the trained model locally, so will Augur. The key thing is there is this distinct deploy phase. But those are the sort of like, get it set up phase, you know, ITPD. Um, and by the way, for those of you that haven't figured it out, Prady pipeline is just our nice mnemonic. Well, we find it a useful mnemonic. It's a corny anagram of ITED PR is hard to remember, so we just say Prady, which is French for predict. Um, so you're done the ITED, ITED gets deployed. Now you want to start inferencing with new data that happens in the real world. Um, and uh, all of the ones I just mentioned all have give you a hosted service to do that. But of course, you can also go to, um, uh, you can also uh, do this against the local model as well. And um, then the final phase, and this is uh, maybe the more controversial phase, what I'm saying is whether or not you, you know, use Augur or Google or Microsoft or Robot or H2O, you as people delivering systems, I, I saw enough hands raised that I think you're all, like whether you're data scientists or developers, you're all responsible for delivering something that works. And you need to have this review phase. And what I think there's is far too little discussion in the machine learning community, and certainly in the automated machine learning community, about making sure that your models continue to work. In fact, I will go ahead and ask your machine learning vendor, your automobile vendor, what happens when my models degrade? And I think there's a good chance you'll get the answer, oh, no, 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 our models are really good. They won't degrade. That's always false. All models always degrade. It's just a question of how long. So you need to be planning on when and how those models degrade. I'm happy if you're a data scientist and you say, here I have this model I wrote 30 years ago and it still works. Please prove me wrong. But I've been doing neural network stuff for 27 years, um, and I've never seen models that don't degrade. So you need to have, you need to answer for yourself. How are you going to monitor that model's ongoing performance and accuracy? Again, whether or not you have it built into the stuff, it's something that we spend a lot of time on at Augur. How do we give you the tools to monitor that your stuff is still working? How do you keep track of actuals versus prediction? Again, you need to owe it to yourself to whether it's an auto, automobile product or a uh, machine learning product or machine learning approach alone, you need to be thinking about how do I monitor whether they degrade and then how do I quickly and effectively retrain it to handle all this new data that we've got. Of course, AutoML can be very powerful for that because then you don't have to go into a big data science effort, right? You can just say, it's degraded, it's gotten below this accuracy, I can retrain. So we think this is a useful framework. We'd love to hear your feedback. We think this is a useful framework regardless of what doing a, uh, what kind of AutoML you use to think about using your AutoML project. Um, so we've built this A2ML um, open source tool. It's completely free. You can use it. Fork it. Fork it. Give it your own name. Take credit for it. It's fine. Um, uh, I would encourage you, this is truly open source. Uh, if you want to add support for other things, I would encourage you to give me pull requests. Um, 
Uh, if you want to support other things, maybe Teapot or AutoSK Learn or H2O or Data Robot, it supports Google and Microsoft today. I maintain the Google, running the company, all I have time for is to maintain the Google support. I wrote the initial auger support and I have my lead dev maintaining that. I don't even have the bandwidth to maintain the Microsoft support. Any of you looking for like a fun open source project, you know, maybe you're looking for work and you want to brag about something, if you could take on maintaining our Microsoft support, it's, it's a challenge, because they're hosted services, they change all the time. I, in fact, I'm not even, I couldn't even tell you for sure if the, uh, full disclosure here, the Google support works just fine. I always test our stuff against Google just to show are we better. I don't have time to do that against Azure, so may work, it may not work, it certainly worked at one time. If you want to do a fun open source project, it's something that you might enjoy doing. So, git, git clone it, pip install bashy, and you'll do HTML and, and you have a bunch of commands. You have HTML new, of course, if any of you are you know, familiar with Rails or any of those things, it's, in, it's a framework, right? So it gives you a new project, and then after that, you can do import, train, evaluate, deploy, predict, and review against your stuff. And you can do it against any, well, uh, Augur, Google, or Microsoft, or all three, if you choose. Uh, and the way, the way that magic happens is we give you this nice declarative thing um, uh, where um, you give it the name of the project, what providers you're running against, the data source, uh, features that you want to exclude because by default it's going to take all the columns, but you know things like this is the uh, classic Kaggle Moneyball contest, if any of you have ever seen this, I like to use it as a demo, it's sort of fun. Um, like you would keep Team League and Year out, uh, you define the target, this is the target happens to be run scored, Model type is regression, and then we um, we actually use a vocabulary that's very similar to, uh, it's actually very similar to Microsoft Azure's vocabulary, which I actually sort of like. So you know, we adopted a lot of that stuff. We tried to not be like, oh, you're just trying to take the Augur APIs and make that general. So this vocabulary of like numbers of cross-validation folds, numbers of, you know, maximum total time to train, maximum time for an individual algorithm, maximum number of trials, and of course, whichever it hits first, it's gonna stop. So if you have a 60 minute budget and you hit that first, it'll stop that. Um, uh, in, in this case, uh, we had maximum number of, in this case, it'll probably stop even sooner because the maximum total number of trials is 10, and the maximum eval time is one. And this will work, this vocabulary works across all of that, all of those different providers. Um, and it turns out, like as a general rule, these options, Augur is very developer controllable, and so is Azure. So all of these things sort of translate to something, and those things, use Ensemble, there's no equivalent in Google. Google's a bit black boxy. They don't tell you what algorithm won. They don't give you a lot of controllability. They give you a little bit. So these maximum thresholds, they control, but you can't tell Google to go Ensemble something. Um, so, uh, with that, I wanted to jump to, let's see, I'm probably not gonna, what I'll say is if you want the live demo, um, please come, I don't have enough time to do the uh, live demo, come by the booth, we can give you a demo of A2ML. Um, uh, I, I just wanna give you an inspiration of like, I've been saying um, that this opens a lot of opportunities for you as developers. Even if you're in your applications, you don't have something that is, um, that you knew that you wanted to have a predictive model. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for think to, to replace business logic with predictive models. So one example is sorts. If you think about how you sort things, whether you're sorting patients or vehicles in a maintenance system or field service issues or the things that the sales rep could call, there's usually some non-trivial sort order that's in there that reflects somebody's business judgment of, you know, what's the most important things. Well, you can use predictive models for that, and you can like have an objective like, you know, the lowest cost to certain, you know, to deal with the patients, or which vehicles are most likely to fail based upon historical data. Um, and I've seen this work over and over and over again successfully. We have some fun case studies with Augur where we've done it for. Um, uh, medical treatment prediction for myeloma. We've done it with um, we've done it with uh, supply inventory management stockouts where we 
sort of suggest certain things in an order. Um, and um, our belief is that um, AI will eat software uh, just like um, uh, software ate the world. Um, uh, Andreessen predicted that in 2011, that's already happened. But AI will eat software. You're going to see lots less business logic in apps and lots of little micro decisions and small to medium sized models done with uh, predictive models. So I'd encourage you to think about doing that in your apps. And I think I'll, I'll maybe stop a minute early and see if we, if we have time for a question or two. Yeah. Yes. Uh, regarding this last thing that you mentioned, of oh, a lot of business logic being replaced by uh, ML. Well, business logic doesn't need lots of curated data. ML does, at least some. Yeah. Maybe not a ton, yeah. but a little is a thousand instances. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. How, yeah. how is that? How so that, that is that can be a challenge. What I found is that this Prady pipeline is very helpful. That. So you'll see there's, we have this case study come by uh, the Auger booth and we have this case study working with Health Tree that uh, got a bunch of patient data. They actually had, it was only 3,200 um, treatments. And uh, at that point, we started to get a certain amount of legitimacy, but we built it within the whole Prady pipeline. So what happens is uh, we aren't just monitoring for, like, as a model degree, we're monitoring for, do we have a significant enough amount of new data to retrain? So you can. The point is that in many cases, if you've got the business logic completely nailed, maybe you wait till you truly have critical mass. But if you really don't know, like if you're trying to suggest to the patient, I can tell you in my alone, nobody has that, any idea of which of the five popular treatments work. Nobody knows. So how do you sort it? Nobody knows. There is no business logic, right? So you can actually start with some guesses, and then as you get more critical mass, as long as you haven't automated, you can be every night retraining as more people enter their data. So 